Hello, I'm Nathan with a history of current events, and thank you for joining me for the second episode in my coverage of Israel and Palestine. Let's pick up right where we left off. The year was 1948. Israel had just declared its independence as a sovereign state. But as David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, spoke the words that painted the Jewish nation on the map, a civil war was being waged on the streets of Jerusalem between Palestinian and Jewish militias. The countries of the Arab League immediately sent troops into Palestine to support their Arab allies. Or, you know, nab that land for themselves, and destroy the nascent state of Israel before it could find its feet. The first Arab-Israeli war had begun. It was a bitter struggle, but though it saw the armies of seven countries take on just one, the Israeli forces were better trained, organized, and equipped. The country's new army was made up of veterans from the Jewish Brigade, the Haganah, and other paramilitaries and Ben-Gurion had implemented mandatory conscription to bolster their numbers. On top of that, they had smuggled a trove of armaments in from Europe. The Israelis managed to force the Arab armies back, taking most of Jerusalem and the lion's share of the designated Palestinian territory in the process, excluding the west bank of the Jordan River, which was occupied by Jordan, and the 25-mile Gaza Strip along the southwestern coast, which was held by the Egyptians. Rather than the UN-envisioned Havzi split of the land, it was now more on the order of 77-23 in favor of the Israelis, and the 23% that remained to the Palestinians was occupied by foreign, albeit Arab, countries. Israel was given member status by the UN shortly afterwards, while the Palestinians would never achieve a sovereign state of their own. Many Palestinians evacuated the areas the Israelis had taken, fearing oppression and the violence they had seen in villages like Deir Yassin, where Jewish terrorist organizations, Irgun and the Stern Gang, massacred over a hundred Palestinians in their homes. Hundreds of thousands fled to the West Bank, Gaza, and neighboring Arab countries like Lebanon, Jordan, and Syria. It is estimated that half of the indigenous Palestinian ethnic group was uprooted and expelled as a result of the war. Ironically, given their own history of displacement, Israel had caused a Palestinian exodus, known to the Palestinians as the Nakba, the catastrophe. After their victory, more Jews continued to immigrate from around the world, and for the first time in almost 2,000 years, the majority of the residents within the borders of Israel were Jewish. Tensions between Israel and its Arab neighbors didn't just vanish after the war. The Arab countries refused to recognize Israel's existence, and there were near-constant attacks from the Fedayeen, a Palestinian militia based in Gaza, which were met tit-for-tat by Israeli counterstrikes. In the 1956 Suez Crisis, Israel attacked Egypt along with their British and French allies and took Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula. They ended up giving it back under international pressure, but this didn't exactly put them in the good graces of the Arabs. And with no official peace agreement and Fedayeen terror attacks continuing, the stage was set for the next wave of conflict. In 1967, with relations deteriorating and acting on false intelligence that the Israelis were planning to attack them once again, Egypt assembled its forces in a defensive line along the Israeli border. This build-up sent alarm bells blaring in Tel Aviv, and Israel launched a series of preemptive strikes against them, kicking off the Six-Day War. As its name suggests, the conflict was embarrassingly brief for the Egyptians and their allies in the Arab League, who had mobilized to come to their aid. You see, an alliance with the United States had been established, under the Kennedy and Ben-Gurion administrations, to counter the USSR's supplying of weapons to the Arab nations, and Israel had begun receiving more sophisticated arms and financial aid from the superpower than their adversaries could ever hope to bring to bear. By the week-long war's end, Israel had seized the remaining Palestinian territories of the West Bank and East Jerusalem from Jordan, Gaza and the Sinai Peninsula once again from Egypt, and as icing on the cake, the Golan Heights from Syria. 
many Palestinians found themselves displaced once more, with more than half, about 1.6 million people, forced to live abroad. Those that did not flee abroad now lived under Israeli military occupation with few guaranteed rights or protections. The Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO, had been created only a few years before as a sort of proto-governing body, and now they called on Palestinians to fight the Israeli occupiers and petition the international community to act. While the UN recognized the PLO as the legitimate representative of the Palestinian people in the wake of the war, and asked Israel to kindly return to its pre-1967 borders, Israel gave them the diplomatic middle finger and continued to occupy all the territory it had seized. The 1973 Yom Kippur War, launched by the Arab states to reclaim their lost territories, only ended with Israel handing their Arab neighbors another defeat. Five years later, Egypt and Israel signed the Camp David Accords, brokered by U.S. President Jimmy Carter, which saw Israel return the Sinai Peninsula and the two countries agree to a treaty of peace. With its largest army no longer willing to attack Israel, the Arab League was no longer the threat it once was, and Jordan would later go on to sign a similar peace agreement. However, terrorist organizations associated with the Lebanon-based PLO continued to launch attacks against the Israeli people, and in 1982, Israel invaded southern Lebanon with the goal of eliminating the organization. After months of fighting, the PLO agreed to remove their forces from the Lebanese capital of Beirut in return for guarantees of safety for the Palestinian refugees living in camps around the city. Despite this, Israeli forces surrounded the refugee camps of Sabra and Shatila, moved in to rout them, and massacred hundreds of men, women, and children. It was in the wake of this war that Hezbollah, the Iran-backed political and military organization was formed, and from Lebanon they've launched all manner of assaults, suicide bombings, and rockets against Israel, claiming hundreds of lives over the years. Meanwhile, back in Israel, the Israeli government had been encouraging Jewish settlements in occupied West Bank and Gaza in an attempt to shift the demography of those regions in their favor and disenfranchise the Arab population. This practice has been widely condemned as a violation of international law. However, by this point, Israel had become the greatest single receiver of military aid from the United States, and the U.S. consistently used its veto vote in the U.N. to block resolutions condemning Israel. Discrimination against the Palestinian people, especially with regards to water distribution and the restriction of trade, continued, and there was nothing the Palestinians could do about it at least not peacefully. These repressive practices led to the First Intifada, a period of dissent and violence between 1987 and 1993 in which the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza rose up in protest. Many committed acts of civil disobedience, like blocking major roads, while others rioted. The Israeli police and military quickly resorted to using live ammunition and indiscriminate beatings to suppress the protests, killing around 1,200 Palestinians, a quarter of them children, with 130,000 more injured and thousands arrested. Collective punishment, like the Israeli destruction of Palestinian houses, the closure of their schools, and the outlawing of their labor unions and civic organizations, dominated this period. This cemented resentment among the Palestinians and gave rise to a name you're all too familiar with by now, Hamas. In 1988, the Palestinian National Council declared the independence of the Palestinian state, though all of its territory continued to be occupied and it hasn't been recognized by most of the international community. Still, there was a great deal of international sympathy for the Palestinian people at this point, and an effort was made to bring the two sides to the negotiating table. The 1993 Oslo Accords were signed, which saw the PLO accept Israel as a sovereign state, pledging for its part to end the terrorist attacks, and Israel recognized the PLO as the legitimate representative of the Palestinians. The two began negotiating for a peaceful resolution to the conflict, but though there was progress at the outset, 
like the gradual deoccupation of the West Bank and the creation of an elected Palestinian authority to govern these areas. The years that followed saw a regression. With the continued growth of Israeli settlements under Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and ongoing economic restrictions on the Palestinians. Another summit held at Camp David, expected to resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for good, failed. In 2000, a second intifada broke out. The Israelis reoccupied the territories they had given over to the PLO, again using excessive and deadly force to quell the protests, and the two sides returned to an entrenched state of enmity. The Palestinian Fedayeen launched suicide and rocket attacks, while Israel responded with bombardments and assassinations. Over a thousand Israelis and around 3,000 Palestinians were killed, with thousands more injured in both sides' attacks. The violence only subsided with the election of peace-seeking Mahmoud Abbas as chairman of the Palestinian Authority and the Israeli construction of a barrier along the West Bank. Israel also unilaterally pulled its settlers and security forces out of the Gaza Strip in 2005, leaving it for the Palestinian Authority to govern, though it would maintain control over the Strip's airspace and borders. That same year, the Palestinian Authority and Israel agreed to a truce not to attack each other. One party that did not agree to this truce, however, was Hamas. In 2006, the same year Israel invaded Lebanon once again to fight Hezbollah, a civil war erupted between Abbas's secular Fatah party, which sought negotiation with Israel, and Hamas, the extreme Islamist militia that had won Palestinian elections and pursued further conflict. While Fatah regained a certain level of control over the Palestinian Authority and the West Bank, Hamas managed to expel them from Gaza completely and violently in 2007. From this stronghold, they began regularly launching rockets, raids, and terrorist attacks against Israel. In response, Israel imposed a blockade of the Strip, cutting off its energy and fuel supplies, which resulted in mass unemployment and poverty for those living there that has pretty much continued unabated to this day. Retaliating against major attacks by Hamas, Israel launched a number of military operations into the densely populated Strip in 2008, 2012, and 2014. Israel claims they have been justified strikes against legitimate targets, attempting to halt the rocket attacks on their cities. But many in the international community have condemned Israel's seemingly disproportionate use of force the collateral damage of which has resulted in thousands of civilian deaths over the years. Both sides have been accused of war crimes in these conflicts. Meanwhile, through recent diplomatic efforts of the United States, Israel began the process of normalizing relations with its Arab neighbors, and some of them even came to agreements ending hostilities that had existed since Israel's inception. And then, of course, on October 7th, Hamas launched its horrific attack on Israel. The immediate conflict has already killed 1,500 Israelis and over 14,000 Palestinians in Gaza, two in five of whom have been children, and displaced over 1.5 million more. The residents of Gaza are facing shortages of food, water, fuel, and other essentials, and it's likely to get far worse in the coming months with Israel's ground offensive. Currently, there are 5.9 million Palestinians living in exile abroad, many in poverty-stricken refugee camps in surrounding countries, while 3.2 million live under Israeli occupation in the West Bank, and 2.2 million are feeling the brunt of Israeli retaliation in the Gaza Strip. At the same time, there are over 7 million Jewish citizens of Israel, living alongside 2 million Arab citizens, all of whom are under constant threat of being the victims of terrorist attacks. Over 20 million people, caught in a conflict that none alive today started, but many alive today, Israeli and Arab alike, have perpetuated. Proponents of either side have said their actions are justified, but the barbaric attack by Hamas on innocent Israelis was wrong. The collective punishment perpetrated by the Israeli government against the Palestinian civilians is also wrong. The actions of both sides have been unjust and will only serve to further radicalize each other, continuing the pattern of violence that has persisted for decades. 
As you can see, the history of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is a tragic story of two sides failing to recognize the rights, legitimacy, suffering, and even humanity of the other. It's not a tale of religious differences, nor is it a tale of millennia-old conflict like many seem to believe, but rather one of competition over land between two peoples driven by national identity, which began just a hundred years ago under the British mandatory system. And until these two peoples realize that they have far more in common than what separates them and learn to live together, travesties like what occurred on October 7th and the siege of Gaza will continue. More innocents from both sides will die, and their children will never know peace. And that's where things stand today. I know it's been an incredibly depressing topic, and for my part, I've been losing my fair share of sleep in the research process for these episodes. I've tried to keep the story condensed enough that you're not lost in all of the players involved in this conflict and their myriad motivations, but in the process, I've left out some fascinating figures, as well as a fair number of atrocities committed by both sides. Hopefully, though, you've learned something over the course of the narrative and come to understand that this is by no means a black and white issue, but a nuanced, multifaceted, ethno-political conflict that has been going on for the better part of a century. I encourage you to do even more research on this issue, and if you have questions about any of it or would like to suggest the topic of the next episode, let me know in the comments or shoot me an email at historyofcurrentevents at gmail.com. And as always, thanks for listening. Thank you.